let me try it uh, sure. now i'm able to you are able to do all right great so hi good morning good evening everyone um, this is ritu from hyperledger hyderabad chapter along with me is kartike um, we co lead the hyperledger hyderabad chapter together and we are very pleased today that betina is with us it's an honor betina i had been your fan uh, all this while the kind of work that you do um, and i'm super excited with this topic because this is something very unconventional and not many people have talked about it it's a blend of you know how blockchain meets the ai generated work um and this is super amazing um and people who know betina i think she has got so much of varied kind of experience uh, be it finance be it creative field um be it blockchain bitcoin uh, you know helping young ladies and and i mean it's a it's it's a mix of almost everything which is which is why you know i'm so we are very honored to have her on this uh, session today um before she goes ahead and introduces herself i want to tell everybody that you know um this is going to be a really full session please keep your questions uh, on the chat and what we will do is take up your questions at the once betina is done with her presentation but just in case if you have any pressing questions um of course you can um just message down to me or kartike uh, personally we will uh, take them take them up at that particular time only so betina floor is all yours thank you so much for taking time and coming here um i would let you introduce yourself thank yes you. thank you so much for having me uh again i hope everybody can hear me clearly Um, I am Bettina. I am the founder and CEO of Betty Media, which is a studio, uh, in a creative studio that I started in 2008. Um, basically, a year after I had left the world of finance, I used to work in Wall Street. I used to work with the big names, the um, Lehman Brothers. more uh JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, you name it. And um I spent my time there for over maybe about 8 years. I went straight from high school, went to the world of finance and um I was a financial analyst. I never thought I I would get stuck in that world and so but I did <laughs> and then um but I was never happy around uh, at all cuz you know really my core has always been I have been a creative person um pretty much all my life um when I was younger I was doing painting and music and acting and you name it so but uh a around maybe mid 2000s that's when i was playing around with my space and i used to basically hack the front end back then they you know they allowed us to customize the front page and at the time we all didn't know what coding is we didn't know what html is but we were just doing it so i am a self taught um and uh but at, as time went on i would go back to college i would go to college for uh graphic design uh concentration in web design and animation and uh i don't know who that is <laughs> everin everin can you please keep your i I don't think. Give, give me a second. Um, sure. I would. Um, Bettina, you have to unmute yourself now. Yes, I did. Perfect. All right. And and uh, before that, just a quick note. Everybody, request everyone to please keep yourself on mute unless until you have a question. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Please go on. no problem and so just long story short i would you know get into the world of design and ux design and i never thought i would be in the world of blockchain and crypto it was around the time of 2013 i was asked to redesign a uh, city the actual bank um one of their trading portal in my time there i would basically learn of bitcoin at the time it went over my head i really didn't think of anything i just thought it was a silly idea 
Five years later, I'm watching a program on Andrea Sintonopoulos in regards to the future of internet and uh, the future of money. And um, I had my aha moment. I would get into the rabbit hole of blockchains. And one of the first crypto event that I went to happened to be the world of crypto art, crypto artist group. And um, I saw, you know, how smart contracts work, how um, artists were using the smart contract. So it's very, at the time, it just made, I it all made sense. It all came together. And um, so the last six years, I've conducted independent research in the world of blockchain, uh, conducted due diligence to, you know, for various companies, um, while my day job is still running my own creative agency with my team. And so, um, like, let's get started. Um, what I've been doing also is that, um, which is interesting, the last year or so, uh, I got into AI filmmaking. Because a few years ago, I started really getting into the uh, to filmmaking, um, but not in AI, nothing related to blockchain, but I really loved the uh, uh, directing films. So I was directing a lot of films and overseas and the conversation of blockchain was often talked about um, in the world in Europe and how to protect a lot of these works. Um, and uh, something that was interesting to me. And uh, many in the film industry has been talking about it the last couple of, you know, really about the last two years, really. Um, so if you're in the world of film three, if you follow the hashtag film three on Twitter, you'll see quite a number of well-known um, filmmakers, even uh, Al Pacino's daughter is in the world of film three. So um let's get started um but before yeah before i delve into you know ai filmmaking it's understanding what blockchain is uh, oftentimes people get it um you know it confused what i will say is that you know just full disclosure full disclaimer is that me and whatever i say is not you know i my company as well you know we're not affiliated or in any way shape or form with hyperledger so my thoughts and what i say here is my own and um again thank you for having me ritu um i am in a group called Call the Phoenix Guild, a group of women where we basically, including non-binaries, we um, they mostly based out in India, where women help and mentor other women in tech and non-tech, uh, learn about blockchain, Web three coding, Solidity, Rust, DAOs, you name it, including finding jobs. So I was invited to speak with you in regards to this topic. And she had informed me you all generally cover tech topics and more details around Hyperledger, but haven't done much talking on public chains and layer two. And so before I had accepted this talk, I did inform her my views on Hyperledger and that there is a misunderstanding sometimes on Hyperledger and that it's blockchain that really, in fact, it is a distributed ledger and there are pros and cons to it, just like blockchain technology, which is uh, blockchain technology is a decentralized ledger, which is permissionless and censorship re resistant. So I wanted to make that clear because of what we're going to be discussing regarding uh, the smart contract and blockchain based um layer two products that uh, could help uh alleviate some of the situations that we are having and again each have their own benefits depending on what one or a business is trying to achieve that that's you know that you have to do careful research on and so um in regards to um the space blockchain space often we are uh, it, what's brought up is the equity and fairness. Where is it? Often I see many, including companies, reverting back to their old ways and not embracing what actually works to combat the inequity and the inequality. And often it's due to fear of the government, shareholders, lack of education, and the powers that be, you name it. And so 
One of the recent events is the AI-generated works. Many have been worried about whether uh, they will have jobs in the future, right? Today, I'm here to give you a little bit of peace of mind. AI will not replace humans. Again, repeat after me, AI will not replace humans. But what it will cause is major income inequality. So far, it has caused about 50 to 70% decrease in wages just in the U.S. alone, according to the U.S. National um, Bureau of Economic Research alone. And so worldwide, it's getting harder. Um, I thought what could help is to show that there are equitable solutions to alleviate or minimize this problem. And so creators such as artists, designers, filmmakers, photographers, writers, journalists, and so forth and so on, oftentimes they get the short end of the stick and have it worse. And so the reality, and I've thought long and hard on this, the reality is I, for true equity to work, it requires decentralization. It's by making adjustments to the imbalances. So think of it, think of equity as like picking apples from a tilted tree or curved tree. For it to be fair, you need to customize tools to identify and address any quality for one to reach the apple tree if one is not tall enough, right? So you see in this image, there's a curved tree. One uh, is able to easily pick the, tr uh, the apple with a shorter ladder, while the other one had to have an adjusted a ladder that's a bit taller to reach the apple. And no one is interfering from them picking the apple. All they have is a customized tool to help them reach the apple tree. And so the tools that we have, these are not new tools. For some reason, the media have demonized the space so much the blockchain and cryptocurrency um, space, and it has portrayed it as some big scam. And what I will tell you is that um, blockchain and cryptocurrency, that idea has existed for what, about three, four decades? <laughs> uh, long before Satoshi Nakamoto decided to do uh, develop Bitcoin. And the godfather of blockchain and cryptocurrency is David Chom. He had written uh, his paper on um, this distributed ledger, and you can read it online, uh, feel free to do so, back in the 80s. And so um, he had stated from the get-go that blockchain will decentralize power. That was what it was meant to do. Um, and his research laid out the technological basis for blockchain and Bitcoin. And smart contracts, for some reason, many think it's Vitalik who created smart contract and I'm and it's not. It's uh, Nick Sabo, who is one also a uh, computer scientist. Back in, 90, in 94, he had written a paper uh, regarding smart contract. He was the one who coined the term. And so uh, recently I saw someone on LinkedIn uh, after, I guess, the, the, the department of the United States Department of DOJ, I guess, um, indicted another group of scammers um, for uh, uh, basically stealing $350 million. And um, this person on LinkedIn had basically stated it was smart contracts fault. And uh, I wanted to uh, answer him, but I just didn't feel like it because, you know, in due time, people will know. And what I will say is that he stated that smart contract is neither smart nor contracts. And something he, he's correct because the term should never have been stated called smart contract. It really is a scripted um, string of language code. But again, um, so I mean, it is what it is. And so he did stated that. It, he thought it was mindless, grossly misleading, and foolish Web3 catchphrase, but 
again, at some point, you will know that smart contract is not a new thing. It's existed since 19, in the 90s, and, um, and it actually can work. It's been working for many artists uh, the last two decades. And so in regards to AI-generated works, right? AI-generated works is really deep learning algorithm trained on data sets of millions of millions of images, descriptions, and writings, and variations of works scraped from the internet. And um, how people have it been introduced with AI-generated works is through AI-generated art. And what I will say is, love it or hate it, they are here to stay. And AI, it will change what com companies create. Uh, it, it's changing co how companies create content. And so some have stated it will replace stock photography and imageries. Yes and no. Most likely they will work hand in hand with stock photography and images that you see that many have collected online. And it will be similar to how we see music. And if you know that music today has been, you know, have used past works and samples to create something new, it's similar to this. For AI generated art, it's basically a, a taking works of art and coming up with new work through basically users um, entering prompts um, to try to come up with a new idea. And another AI tool that most many, many have gotten involved in and uh, completely mesmerized is the chat GPT. And ChatGPT is a powerful AI bot developed by OpenAI. And the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So basically, it's when you enter a prompt or a command or an action sentence, um, it's basically used to communicate with the AI and other AI language models such as ChatGPT. And so you will see that from this example that there are limitations and you know there the limitations can vary. So it can right now as ChatGPT the way it is right now, it has generated incorrect information. Um, does it, ha it has also produced harmful instructions and biased content. And much of the um, data is all from the Western um, areas. And so uh, just to keep, to keep that in mind, you know, and so, and um, for years, AI researchers and those who work closely with AI have been sounding the alarm in regards to the bias content and how um, when working with AI and companies ought to have diverse um, uh, workforce to build these types of AI. And there was a reason for that. And, um, and this is what's going on. And so far, it's been both awesome and also chaotic and crazy. But know that it's limited with knowledge of the world and events. From what it said, it's only taking information from after 2021. And so chat GPT is not in, you know, all the other generated art tools are not um, the first um, bots. And so the history of chatbots is interesting because it dates back to 1965. And the first one happens to be Eliza. And Eliza is basically interesting. It was created by Joseph Weissenbaum. The bot was designed in a way to mimic human conversation. And so if you read here, it's very similar to how you see chat GPT. And so how he built it was Eliza worked 
by passing the words that users entered into a computer and then pairing them to a list of possible scripted responses. And the script that they use was the simulated psychotherapist script. And so here you will see Eliza mocks the Ro Rogerian uh, psychotherapist work. And so the original program was described by uh, Joseph Weiss and Bob in 1966. And so this it, it was implemented by the Nobert Landstein in 2005. And so this is a uh, you know what you will see. I don't. I you can feel free to check by. Um, the recording to read it so we can move on. Um, what's interesting about Eliza, and it's very similar to what's happening now, is that Mr. Weizenbaum also was disturbed of how many users were confiding their most profound thoughts on Eliza. And it's similar to ChatGPT, where I've noticed friends who are basically asking uh, ChatGPT many things I've never thought they would. But, you know, and when I checked Eliza, it was pretty much very similar, right? And uh, Weissenbaum stated as well. He rejected the idea that machines or AI could replace human or human intellect. And so similarly, he did notice that many of the users were anthropomorphizing um, AI. And so what I will say is that humans for centuries have always anthropomorphized things from deities to statues to cars, you know, when, you know, I have no friends who name their cars. And so uh, it, it's all because, you know, of connection, they have faith in, and, um, and it's, it's human nature, but AI is not human. Um, and I know this because I too built a robot back in 2012 and 2013 for my thesis statement for my bachelor's at um, a Fashion Institute of Technology where I got my graphic design and design degree. And so I, my thesis was on human robot interaction and artificial companionship. And so what I did notice is that the ch children, my friend's kids, this is them, um, for some reason did seem to see the bot as like a little human. And uh, while, you, you know, the adults were kind of mesmerized and yes, they did ask lots of questions about the weather and music and all that. But at the time, the software that I did use in programming it wasn't as efficient as what we have now. And so you all of us have to remember AI is just a tool and that AI is a processor and that, you know, kind of like a blender. And so how I can explain to people in regards to AI, it's basically like you have a concoction or uh, uh, an idea for, to make uh, 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 an amazing dish in the kitchen, right? In mind that you wanna make, and it's, you know, a dish is like an art or piece of work too as well. But to do that, you got to either make it all, make all the ingredients from scratch or be organic by growing your own veggies, fruits, and spices. Think of that as the sources of where the AI is pulling from to create the new concoction or art. However, you decide if it's too much and if it, it takes too much time, you can choose to go to the market to get all the ingredients um, that the farmers have grown themselves, right? And now, do you take all the ingredients from the sources, quote unquote, the market and walk away without paying the market or the farmer? 
Or do you buy the ingredients and the sources that you need to make your concoction? And why I'm saying is there is that there has been debates whether AI works are similar to human work and whether AI works can be copyrighted. When it comes to recipes, they are not protected by copyright due to the idea expression dichotomy. It's basically this um, legal doctrine in the US and Europe have um, uh, adopted that as well. It's to differentiate from an idea versus an expression. And I will um, say that I am not a copyright lawyer, but I do have works that are trademarked and copyrighted. And um, what I will say to you is um, recipes, right? Um, can they be protected? While they can't be copyrighted, um, Yes, they can be patented, but it has to be, again, incredibly unique, a novel process or a manufactured recipe. Not obvious to anyone. It must be a utility with full disclosure. This is what the court stated. And a way to remember is like Coca-Cola, you know, uh, that beverage or that uh, sugar degree soft drink, very distinctive drink. It's like no other. Um, it's interesting because Coca-Cola had patented their, their recipe back in the 1800s, but as time went on, they decided to not, um, because they changed the, uh, the recipe through the years, that they decided to not patent it to basically to ensure the recipe remains undisclosed. So it's a trade secret. Um, just keep that in mind. And so why I'm saying all this, it comes back to the whole inspiration versus imitation. And so many seem to be confused about the difference between, between them. And so take, for instance, my favorite chef, Anthony Bourdain, rest in peace. And he once said, there is no lying in the kitchen and no God there either. He couldn't help you anyway. You either can or can't make an omelet. You either can or can't chop an onion, shake a pan, keep up with other cooks, replicate again and again perfectly the dishes that need to be done. There is no credential, no amount of BS, no well-formed sentences or pleas for mercy will change the basic facts. And so what he's trying to say is that I have his cookbook, uh, Leal uh, Cookbook. And when I want to spruce up his signature dish, the Boeuf Bourguignon, I, I'm imitating him. I'm copying what he wrote in his book. Does it make, this doesn't make me a three, four, five star Michelin chef. I'm not a world renowned chef. And so why is that? Because these are people who are professional who have been doing this for all their lives. They have studied, they have studied spices, they have studied every food in the world, you name it. They know how to grow, they know what people love. They know this art more than anyone else. And so can I get inspiration from them? Yes. Can I take uh, what Anthony did and try to make a twist out of it? Absolutely. But it has to be distinctive to the point where it's not so recognizable like Anthony's birth bourguignon. And so going back to AI generated art, the last few months, a lot of artists and designers have recognized a lot of these AI generated art instantly. And why is that? It's because 
Well, it turns out most of these art were coming from D a Deviant Art, which is a website uh, that has what over three hundred something million. I if, I forgot the number, but it, they have such an insane amount of art from artists who had uploaded their works for years and years and years. And each of them have their own style. Each of them have their own interpretation. And so a lot of the AI generated art was basically, let's just say anyone who was prompting the, the, the AI, what it was doing, it was blending works scraping things from the internet to blend it and come up with quote unquote something new but problem is it wasn't so new because people were recognizing the written signature of the original artist so similar lead to what I was saying about Anthony Bourdain's uh, birth bourguignon which is his basically beef uh it's a beef stew just so people know what it means. But, you know, if I was to imitate it, it's imitation. But if I was to make a little twist, it has to be so distinctive of it, it very different from his, where people do not recognize it is his. But I could say, yes, this was inspired by the Anthony. Um, and because of all of this, um, attention of uh, many artists had to call this out. Um, there is now a class action lawsuit um, a, uh, for basically these AI generated tools, scraping and collaging the works without consent. And so Deviant Art, um, for some reason was no in November had, um, basically stated they had a new tool as a way for creators to take back control, but it turns out they were had um, partnered with uh, Stability AI. Um, and so that was interesting. And this was before the lawsuit. And Getty Images is the biggest stock photography uh, company in, in maybe maybe the world, right? And uh, they too had to um, um, sue stable uh, diffusion, AI stable diffusion in the US for copyright infringement. And you can see right here is a perfect example where you see that Getty Images um, um, pretty much modeled um, one of their uh, images without permission and without compensation. And so I'm saying all this because this is interesting. Um, last year, ooh, last year, um, I get, yeah, Beyonce came out with a new album. Um, for you beehives, you know, I guess I did this for you beehives, but I'm not a major fan or anything like that. But it just was one. This one was very interesting because their her new album Renaissance um, had, from what I understand, almost over a hundred samples of artists. And one of the biggest question in the music world, um, many have asked whether or not this amount of sample is really original work um, and um, because when it comes down to quote unquote these awards shows these award ceremonies um, they often want to provide that award to people who actually you know did create a new work of art um, and so there's been a lot of debate what is uh, new and what is not um, but it's a successful album and the fans love it. And so when it comes to the world of music, um, because in the past, in the early 2000, 
um, when um, the internet, many were getting on it, um, music was being stolen um, if through uh, illegal downloading and peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, uh, file transfers, you name it. And so the music industry and Apple would um, come up with uh, a solution to protect artists, music artists. And so today, you know, it's not unheard of now. Like now, if you want to upload a piece of music with your content, you have to go through clearance. Um, and these are some of the copyright clearances that you have to go through around the world. And, um, you know, LimeWire came back. It was the defunct file sharing website that basically uh, was shut down back in 2010 for, you know, if illegal file transfer. And um, they went through a le lengthy legal battle with the recording industry. And so they were accused of allegation of music piracy and sort of federal judge uh, found the platform caused copyright inf infringement on a massive scale. And so they came back and they decided that, you know, they want to get into the world of digital collectibles. So they have partnered and struck a deal with the world of Universal Music Group uh, to help with uh, music NFT licensing, um, which is interesting because this is a, this is the uh, one of the original platforms that was um, really doing decentralized peer-to-peer um, uh, transactions. And so now in regards to one of my passion the last year has been the AI filmmaking. And, um, I just showed you a lot of like, um, what the music business have done and what's been going on with the world of art um, in AI filmmaking, which is interesting, um, they've embraced AI. Um, now, one of the things we had seen the last couple of years were deep fakes because initially their intent was to deceive. And um, they are incredibly in terrifying at first glance, but a lot of people, and me included, saw some use to it. And what I mean by that is that, for instance, you know, these are two uh, night show hosts. Um, I put it in because this is interesting because um, they switched, they swapped uh, John Oliver's face with Jimmy Fallon's face. And you could see how incredible it has become. And why I'm showing this is because in the film industry, um, reshoots are expensive. And what that means is when you're making a film, sometimes um, you may have missed something or missed a scene or missed part of a scene, missed something that's in the scene that didn't need to be there and you need to reshoot. And oftentimes you can't, the art, the actor is not available, or maybe they're on another film set or across the country. What do you do? Um, so now there are solutions in regards to could there be a model or their stunt double to you be able to, um, you know, um, take them in place and to do these type of, um, you know, um, swapping. And again, um, the the actor can actually license their imagery, their, their voice and likeness in their contract and state this. Um, and so recently, um, the Mark Edrison from, um, he's a VC and the rocket scientist, I'm not kidding you, Aaron, um, Kamner, his name is, they decided to go on Twitter and create a movie. <laughs> they did a full script on chat GPT. They had chat GPT write a full script and come up with a hundred story ideas. This is not too long ago. Um, 
write 100 story ideas and 50 scripts, including the pre-production, the shot list. And this is what we do. Um, and it was pretty incredible because I was like, this is really awesome. It's pretty simple. It's a, because, you know, yes, creating scripts takes time. Um, so coming up with ideas sometimes takes time. And so when it came down to chat GPT, it was, was able to provide all these shots, one detail, the details of the shots, the props, the outfits, you name it, the outfit details, again, through prompts. Um, you know, the user has to ask questions and really try to get their answer that they want. And so the full script was able to, uh, they plug in DALI 2, which is another AI tool, AI art generated uh, art tool and mid journey to get some of the imagery. In filmmaking, this would be basically the storyboard. We would either draw it out or come up with imageries to kind of get the store what the look and feel would be for the story and so they were able to get all of that by plugging in all these various tools and um, they brought in actors and these actors were able to uh, memorize the script you can see it online it's called AI writes a directs a movie it's crazy now the bad part of this is it wasn't a great script. It was really bad and funny and awkward and somewhat cold. So it, that's one thing about the AI. So what's good, again, it's efficient. It does help with um, um, gathering your thoughts, but oftentimes um, it's not the best tool to rely. You have to make sure um, you are uh, proofreading, you are editing, you are fact-checking it. Um, and the thing about ChatGPT, a lot of, of the outputs are so generic, so they're not too interesting. So you got to keep that in mind. But as time go, goes on, I can see it being more interesting as more people uh, start playing with it. And what's that about it? Um, Again, we were talking about uh, what I mentioned earlier was the um, can will people lose their jobs? Yes. Will um, will there be inequality, income inequality? Yes. But um, more jobs will be created. That we will need researchers and editors and um, fact checkers. Um, and another thing that I recently noticed some. A lot of people started using it to uh, clone websites. Uh, very dangerous because uh, some of these websites been cloned, and a lot of people mistook the website uh, for for another website, the real one. And so uh, you got to be very careful with them because they are they they can be risky, and so there are scammers out there actually cloning by using these AI tool chat GPT to clone websites and uh, identical. And so if you're buying something from those websites, um, you may need uh, you may end up getting robbed. Uh, so you have to check if this is a legitimate website, and that's where we come in as. Um, uh, where that job will be needed to uh, provide that kind of uh, verification and trust. Um, to, so trust tools may need to be built. And so what's ugly about it, like I said, is generic for now. Um, it still needs people. Um, again, lots of scammers, so keep that in mind. But what's also awesome about these AI tools, is particularly in AI filmmaking, we do see that there's going to be a lot of personalization and CGI licenses. So this is a perfect example. Uh, so there was this app in China where uh, users could like swap their, put their face on actual movies. Um, and so this is a perfect example uh, where you can see yourself as the actor. Um, and so I do see that, you know, down the line that, you know, through smart contracts and blockchain that let's say 
you know, Mr. DiCaprio will license his, his um, himself. And I could see that the, 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 you know, you know, he can be paid through the smart contract, through his wallet, and that's that. And so, and um, that is what we have to remember when it comes to AI technology. It's a, it's a technology and technology is a tool. And it's not human, but there are pros and cons uh, to the AI, just like anything, you know, just like any weapon. Is it a weapon? Can it be weaponized? Can it be used as a weapon? Absolutely. Um, anything can be used as a weapon, but just, I think one of the things that we need to be calling for is regulation. For years, many who work closely with AI, we've been calling for regulation for so long, but it did not happen. And then full control of security and privacy. This is so important because right now there's a lack of security and privacy. And many from what I from last a few months ago, somebody's medical records was found inside on uh, one of the AI uh, tools. So that's just one of the example where again it's scraping information from we don't know where everything and that the the these tools, these softwares, these companies need to be basically providing where are they getting the source. And it's happening more and more where they are starting to do so. And um, OpenAI um, did partner with, um, you know, well, Microsoft took over. And so uh, it's now no longer quote unquote open source. It's now closed. So it's a subscription based um, um, application software. So um, it'll be interesting. Now, the takeaway is that AI is like a blender. Keep that in mind. Um, and that AI will need fact checking and edit and proofread. And I will say research and research and research. Don't stay dependent on Um, it's not something that is far fetched, and um, it's not that it's not difficult at all. It just requires patience and willingness. And so, I guess we will chat a bit more. And you know, this is my contact information. Definitely, do feel free anytime to reach out to me. And then now, yeah, I'll take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Bettina. I just love the fact that how creatively you have, uh, you know, taken this session and helped all of us understand in a very simple terms. I just loved all the uh, pictures you added, be it the apple tree, the ladders, or <clears throat> the other ones, uh, like the blender, blenders and uh, other pictures. Thank you so much. We have one question. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. to answer. So uh, the question is that, do you think the chat GPT will take over the educational tools? Uh, will it stop people from relying on formal education? Well, this is interesting. When it comes to chat GPT right now, a lot of schools are, um, are banning it. I am not surprised mm -hmm. uh, because YouTube is, uh, I, I didn't realize also YouTube is kind of banned in many schools and it, YouTube has been one of the greatest platform for education, but a lot of school has banned it. Um, there is, um, there was a developer programmer who actually uh, did create a tool to verify whether or not um, students are using the chat for if they were to plagiarize. Um, so there are now tools that are popping up to verify if one used chat GPT. Now, I think it would be great for uh, schools to take on chat GPT uh, because why it, like I said, it does help 
want to gather someone's thoughts, but if you notice, it's so generic. Um, so you have to kind of think, I think right now schools are not teaching students how to critically think. We were, I was having a chat with uh, a few people on a business group. The critically thinking part is going to be vital for the future, for now and going in the future. And so that's really how one can break free from the AI. Um, we can't just take it as is. And so those who do think outside of the boss box, those who do think critically will win. Um, and especially if you think critically, you're able to create, uh, create you you're able to come up th with things creatively. And so uh, that's how um, I think about chat GPT and all these AI. Will it stop people from relying on formal some? That's what I'm concerned. I do think that um, many will uh, be dependent on it. Um, like uh, recent, um, like uh, the developer of Eliza, he did notice many uh, did take what Eliza was saying as is, and um, and did think of it as a human. And so I'm not surprised, and I did see that through my own research. Are the schools banning YouTube and Chat GPT because they will lose their importance in the education industry as clearly the education system is lacking to prepare for the future um i don't think so i think uh yes and no um because here's the thing even though youtube has amazing content there's still certain things that it lacks you know i mean when i'm conducting research i don't only depend on youtube i'll go through the archives and you know medical journals and books and all of that it you know you know if you were to go through youtube you know it doesn't have a comprehensive information in regards to art history and mathematics you'll get a general idea but really education um the does I will say the education industry right now, what's really is going on is it's costly. And so that's another reason why people have relied on the on the free services and what's online. It's because it's costly. And so the the industry may need to start looking at new models and 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 thinking how to uh, not make it affordable for goodness sake that's the you know should people are in debt because of education so did not pass okay chat gpt did not pass the test and oversee i thought i'm sorry okay maybe put that i'll ask the other i'll i'll look at the other question I'm not sure what obviously I thought. Okay, what kinds of jobs do you foresee popping up in the com upcoming five years with AI without being an AI engineer? Yes, um, I do see, for example, I brought up websites, right? Uh, someone had brought up websites to me. He was like, oh, it's gonna get rid of all these jobs and web design and all of that, no longer UX. That's not true because, um, what AI is doing is just it's just it, it trying to mimic uh, and scraping um, visual designs. And so you still need behavioral science scientists. Yeah, you still need psychologists and researchers. There's going to be a lot of fact checking. Um, so um, I do see that's what's going to happen. Uh, cybersecurity is going to be needed. Um, uh, just cause things on, you know, on the front end is looking great and look, you know, perceived to look great, but under the hood, it's not smart contract, a programmer is going to be vital. Um, so start sprucing up your smart contract because that's, you know, how people are going to get paid, you know, as more of the courts basically saying, um, you know, um, making their thoughts known that AI generated works are not, can't be copyrighted, but that, you know, how can you protect your work if you're an artist? Start copywriting your 
um, your work. And I think um, if anyone out there other than just lawyers start thinking outside of the box, so what solutions you can offer in regards to uh, copywriting. Right now, copywriting isn't the, you know, the way to go about it isn't uh, great. And um, I had to go through a lawyer and all of that. It's just so cumbersome. And if someone can make it simple, that would be great. And so, yeah, that's one of them. Can we test smart contract using? Uh, there are those who are testing it. Um, from what I remember, there was a WYSIWYG uh, tool, smart contract tool that I was testing a while back. And I had revisited the person who was um, um, is selling it. And I thought, this is a great idea. But this was like about two years ago. And I don't know if the company is still doing it because they had a platform where they can help um, artists and creators uh, write their own smart contract very easily. And so you could use AI uh, to test a smart contract, but you would have to make sure you understand the code. You don't want to have the AI create the smart contract and not know it, it could be it, it could be bad code so there's a lot of bad code so that's something you have to remember um government will put in ai ethics related guidelines i hope so that's been one of the things that many have uh, been calling for for years um and um it should be out there i really I, we need an overall regulation that's big time that's what we really need ai a, a, especially what you saw earlier where the deep fakes i could see deep fakes happening more and more when it comes to the politicians uh, so what's great what's going to happen because more and more defects are going to be popping up in the world of the in the world of the political sphere, I do think that more and more people are going to be showing up in person to hear their 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 official their elected officials, uh, just to confirm who if what they say and uh, are real, legitimately real, instead of. Um, watching tv i don't watch tv i don't even have a tv but this is just a perfect example um it, but younger people are going to be going to events more and more and they are um you're i do see print coming back to um you know high quality prints um uh, people are going to want to books did make a massive comeback for some reason i think people wanted to feel a bit of um connected to paper and not be so much on the screen. So that's another thing you got to keep in mind. We're going to be reverting back to certain things. Um, and yeah, uh, let me see what else. Am I? Many powerful tools require a license. Yes. Don't you think AI will eventually a license for anyone to be able to use it? It would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, for example, can anyone fly an airplane or drive a car? Exactly. Uh, well, anyone who gets the license can. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, right now ChatGPT is a perfect example. So it's subscription based. So from what I understand, the the free version is not. It gives you a limited. Um, the larger one is not limited, so you have to pay for it. So I could see in some ways that that could be, um, yeah, it depends on what it is and how, what they are trying to do. But yeah, I could see that too. Oh, uh, hello, Bettina. Thank you for a wonderfully insightful presentation. I have a question regarding a comment you made. If an AI, like JobGPT, is scraping from unknown sources, how can an artist know their work creation is being used by an AI? Like I said, the written signature, people's written signature, their actual name, they were seeing the, it was coming off, it was coming on it. The output was showing that. Similarly to the, that's how Getty Images was able to catch it. They were able to see um, their name on on the actual um, image. So it was collecting that. That's how they were able to identify that that the chat GPT, uh, the other 
art generated works were um, stealing that. Now for a chat GPT, a little, little bit different because it's text based. Um, it's 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 kind of it's basically similar. It's, it's scraping information off the internet, um, and so the company it states the same thing. So it's not. Uh, it's really the art, the AI art works that we're more likely to see it instantly know that it's um, someone else's work. Cheers, Bettina. You too, cheers. Just a hypothetical question. If AI uses previously made AR to produce new art, will there be a point in like two decades that the art made from AI seem rep yes, repetitive and less creative as the number of original art made is reduced significantly? Absolutely. Right now, a lot of the works, if you see, it's super stylized work and nothing that is, you know, at all, a little bit outside of the box. Um, I think that's what's going to happen. I think it's going to be extremely repetitive, homogenized, and just boring. As we, as like what we see with um, online. If you notice, a lot of people use stock photos, the free stock photos. I've you, I use free free stock photos for placement as before I, you know, launch something before I decide to buy an actual work work, but. Um, but yeah, you free stuff, you have to be very careful. And then with AI generated art, it will be repetitive. It's just gonna, everything's gonna look alike and you can't remember anything. And that's where you guys come in. You you create something new and different. Thanks, Bettina, for such an informative uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, let me see. Thank you, Nasaj. Thank you for the lovely session. Yep. Don't know why, but decentralization <laughs> irritating me because there is something hidden in that. What you say about that? No, it's because it's basically so think of similar to if you were to come to me and buy a piece of actual paint, painting, um, and you give me cash for it. That's decentralization. It's between you and I. There is no banks involved, no one to, to stop us from transacting. That's what decentralization. There's no middleman. Um, it's just the difference is, is that um, with uh, decentralized blockchain is that it's online, you know? Um, and like I said, that has existed for a very long time. Um, but there are... Uh, amazing tools like um, I didn't bring up Bitcoin uh, smart contracts that's pretty cool too because um, there are people who are working on Bitcoin smart contracts and the more and more people trust Bitcoin more than ever um, and um, you know it's been the oldest now um, over a decade uh, cryptocurrency so if you were to um, create an nft now there's nft bitcoin too that i'm still wrapping my head on but they on the protocol um yeah i mean i don't see why not what are the current alternatives to chat gpt there's a company called uh u.com u.com is one um it's a browser they actually had a i think they are using chat gpt or something else but yes chat gpt um u.com is pretty cool they were first to kind of create uh, uh, show what how to use uh, the browser obviously uh google uh had uh, uh theirs was did not go well of uh, again their ai researcher had warned them not to release it but they did and their uh, stock portfolio tanked, um, and so now they end the eighty dollar USD. Um, yeah, they really did a mess because it wasn't. Um, it was, yeah, it was bad. Uh, you can read up on the Google Lambda, or I forgot the name of it. But what opportunities in Web three and AI do you see coming up the horizon for entrepreneurs? As I stated, in um, AI filmmaking is huge. It's growing. Um, so that's Film Three. So if you uh, follow the Film Three hashtag, that's a big one. Um, uh, I do see that more and more um, 
AI generated works is going to be um, used more and more. Uh, people are going to be using um, create web pages, but again, at the end of the day, you're going to need developers and uh, some programmers to ensure that the the test uh, they test the actual site if you were to launch. Um, anything from AI, uh, what else for entrepreneurs? Um, I'll, I'll get back to you Well, There's a lot. Will Bard be the most advanced? Yeah, that's the Google Bard. That's the what I was saying, the alternative chat GP3. Uh, will Bard the most, be the most advanced in chat GP3? I have no idea. I don't think so um, because so much is happening with Google um there will always be something that's gonna come out of nowhere remember i said eliza was one of the first there were other bots um i do think there is a little bit of hype with chat gpt i think it's gonna die down a little bit it's kind of almost similar to alexa when there was so much hoopla with alexa and now it's nobody really I'm not saying no one cares but it's not it's gonna die down but what's gonna really stay is the AI generated art, AI generated film milking on uh, chat GPT will advance a little, a lot more, but well, it's gonna die down. This session was very insightful. Thank you for, for it. You're welcome. Do you mind sharing your Twitter handle? So participants can, yes, my handle is Bettina. And then my other handle for my business is Betty Media. So Bettina is my personal, Betty Media is my, and I'm on LinkedIn. I'm mostly on LinkedIn, but um, feel free to add me if you want. Uh, what else? Don't know why, but decentralized, okay, got that. I'm a blockchain, but I still, I found a lot of vulnerabilities in smart contract. Absolutely. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in smart contracts of major projects. I do agree. Again, until more and more people get into smart contracts and build and test, um, it will get better. It's similar to what websites used to be. They were really buggy back then. And people just kept, you know, trying new things. But I will say is that um, do try to uh, work with others, ask around, uh, because so many people are doing so many great projects. And um, they might have thought of something that you may not have thought about. So keep a lookout. That's why I don't think so that every normal can study it. Yes and no. Yeah, it's kind of like websites. You know, not everyone can be web designer. Not everyone can be website designer, but not everyone can be construction workers. So it's similar to that. And I think I got everything, everyone. Yeah. And yeah. that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was really amazing and see how comments are coming in. Um, on the insightful presentation. And of course, the questions also were very good <clears throat> and helped us uh, understand more. Thank you so very much. Um, not everybody knows that it is past midnight for Bettina. <laughs> you a lot of gratitude uh, from us uh, taking time off and you know working, working through <clears throat> showing us the presentation. Um, Thank you really, and thank you everybody to you know come in here, ask your questions, making it more interactive. Uh, any questions uh, you can also post in on the meetup page. And since this is being recorded, the YouTube video would be uploaded on the official Hypertension uh, channel. And I'll also put the link on the meetup group. I'll also put Bettina, your credentials of Twitter and LinkedIn so that people can follow you and keep that knowledge coming through irrespective of the sessions. Thank you so very much. Um, and thank you again so much. I, again, if I sounded long-winded, it was, it's been a long night, but yeah, yeah like I, tr I tried to keep it simple. There's a lot going on again. Mm -hmm. um, and what I say now, just remember what I say now will change tomorrow, as you know, like blockchain. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> just remember and just verify so much is happening every single day okay we also get organizers yeah so yeah okay well feel free to ask me any questions and again really do join film three i would really love to see you guys on there as well and so it you know it's so much exciting things are going to happen in in the space thank you again thank you and can you go to inzik to get one-on-one -on -one meeting what is that i don't know what that is that, that's okay i think that's okay <laughs> okay right. bye bye have, have a, a good night, night. see y'all thank you bye. you're welcome